My stepson Bobby lives with his wife Erica in Seattle, where he moved to work for Amazon. And three years ago, they had a little boy whose name is LB for little Bobby. And about a year ago, they had a second boy they called Hazen. And my wife Ellen was there for both of the verse. So her heart was on the West Coast with her, with her kids. So when it was time for her to retire from Yankee Candle, the plan was set in motion for her to sell her house in Conway, where we've lived together since we got married in 2009, and we'd move here to Seattle to be closer to them. And I would half move, uh, alternating between Seattle and Massachusetts, there where I'm so deeply rooted. Now, the last time I really packed up and moved was 25 years ago, when I left Los Angeles for my dream home in Shelburne. And when I got married to Ellen, I didn't so much move to Conway as drift over gradually. Ellen is neat and likes an orderly environment. Uh, now, I, I also like order, but because of all the things I do, it, it seems I don't usually achieve it. So it seemed best for me to leave my chaos in my little bachelor house and not bring too many things to Conway. So the, proc the packing process began in January. Ellen, an executive assistant who's used to organizing things and making things happen, eagerly set to work and packing boxes appeared. So did a big storage unit in the front driveway so we could load it over time uh, so the house wouldn't be too cluttered to make a good impression on the real estate market. The experience of taking inventory opening drawers that you're rarely opening and discovering the things you didn't even know you had and packing everything you have into boxes is literally a time to take stock of your life. Now, what do you have that you don't need anymore? Should you move it, sell it, give it away? What's absolutely essential to your life? Now, I'm, I'm slow to get rid of things but because I was moving, I took five or six carloads of clothes and other household goods to the Salvation Army in Greenfield to lighten the load somewhat. Moving is a real challenge. According to some psychologists, it's the third most traumatic thing you can go through after getting divorced or widowed. And after all, how much of the stress of divorce is due to the fact that one of you at least has to move out? Moving is more stressful than childbirth, getting married, job interviews, and final exams. Now, Americans move about half as much as they did in the 1980s, and maybe the stress of dragging all our stuff around is one of the reasons why. Anyway, so the house was all newly painted, in, inside, and out. It was decluttered depersonalized, fixed up the best that we could. And the real estate agent had a photographer come to take pictures of this house that was more beautiful than any time we actually lived in it. Now, for good measure, when the house went on the market, we left town for a month so we wouldn't get in the way of showings. And someone eventually liked the house so much, they made us a reasonable offer. So we came back to Conway to get ready for the actual move. Now, it took two days for the men from the moving company to, you know, blanket wrap all the furniture, load fit more stuff into boxes and carry all the boxes into a moving van headed to our new place in the Seattle area. Ellen flew ahead, but I had to stay behind to work and take care of the property in Conway and my house in Shelburne until the sale actually closed. Now I spent August living in an empty house with no rugs on the floor, no pictures on the wall, no real furniture, only bare floors, a card table, and a leaky air mattress. Living that Spartan existence with only a few utensils and plates, eating down the store of canned goods left in the pantry and the freezer, prompted me to think about my relationship to the material things of my life and their value or lack of value. We accumulate so many things in our lives, and when they're not in their usually place, it throws you. I kept opening empty cabinets out of habit or turning a corner thinking I would lie down on a couch that wasn't there anymore. I was constantly reaching for the ghost of something that was on its way across country, you know, a spatula to turn the hamburger, some paper to make some notes. 
Not all the little things are so trivial. One morning I woke up at 4 a.m. feeling feverish, and I went to the medicine cabinet to take my temperature, but the thermometer had gone to Seattle. And coming down with COVID in a house that didn't have a, a couch to rest on or a television to watch was another example to me of how we shouldn't take our possessions for granted. We'll find out when they're not there how much we might need them. Think back on your life, the different places you've lived and the transitions you've gone through. You know, you grew up in your parents' house and maybe they had to move for a job or because of a divorce. And then you went away to college, perhaps, living in a dorm away from home for the first time. Then after graduating, you moved to your first apartment for your first job. And maybe you then met someone and started a family and had to move to accommodate the kids. And all during this time, you acquire things and you let go of others. Finally, as most of us in my stage of life contemplate, we think about moving closer to the kids or to more senior-friendly housing. Each one of these moves is an opportunity for spiritual, psychological, and emotional growth, or for trauma. It isn't easy to say goodbye to the things you've loved that are there where there's no place for them in your new dwelling. Now, many spiritual traditions say that a wise person cultivates detachment from physical things. Mahatma Gandhi, for example, had only a pair of sandals, a journal, and a watch, uh, a few other things at the time of his death. Now, yes, it's important to recognize the transience and impermanence of things, but I don't think that kind of detachment is for everyone. As Madonna sang, we are living in a material world. It's natural to customize our environment to suit our needs and desires, having a place to hang your photos, the drawers where you put your sweatshirts, the place in your garage where you store your tools. And if you've lived in a place for a long time, there's a lot of embedded value in the way you've arranged your stuff. As George Carlin said, home is a place where you keep your stuff. We can't be naive about what living in the material world means. Now, while Judeo-Christian prophets are skeptical of riches and wealth, they're not anti-materialistic per se. You know, for the first millennia or two of Judaism, it was focused entirely on this world. They had no concept of an afterlife the way that Christians later had. The Messiah would come to bring a revolution on earth, not transport us to heaven. Judaism has no tradition of monks and nuns that take a vow of poverty and chastity. In fact, chastity is very un-Judaic. Jesus certainly preaches against the wealthy, but he never asked Joseph to get rid of his hammers, saws, and carpentry tools. He doesn't ask his disciples, the fishermen, to stop obsessing over their nets and boats. He's not so transcendent as to reject the oil being rubbed on his feet or the wine offered to him at a wedding. An example of someone who preaches the gospel of living very light is the character that George Clooney plays in the movie Up in the Air. He is in the outsourcing business. He or out basically firing people. <laughs> and he gives speeches about what's in your backpack, saying that there should be as little as possible. But in the course of that movie, we see that his whole life is empty. Those who tell us we don't need things neglect the fact that people are inherently creative. We make our living by making things, artworks, tools, clothes, furniture, instruments, electronics. And when we excavate the prehistoric sites of our ancestors, we find their bowls, spearheads, pottery, tools, and cloth and jewelry. When I'm cleaning things out, the most dangerous question for me to ask is, will this be useful someday? I often go to the junk drawer to find a little bit of wire to fix something or an old takeout container to catch some mold motor oil. And so I'm vulnerable to that question. Your relationship to everything you have is important. We can't hide in a, a kind of spirituality 
that we don't need a roof over our heads living in, in a cave somewhere. If there is a cave somewhere, I'm sure it's listed on Zillow for $2,000 a month. What do you really need? What do you really value? And what keeps you tied down, keeping you from your best life? When you move from one place to another, it more or less forces you to take a fresh look at everything you have and decide if it's worth carrying to another place. So there is wisdom in continually evaluating your possessions to make sure they're providing you for you, not keeping you from making the changes you need to make. <clears throat> All of us have driven by houses where the people have lost control of their stuff. You know, the, the front yard and the backyard are full of all kinds of stuff, toys, appliances, maybe a car that hasn't been moved for years in the driveway. The house usually has peeling paint and broken windows. To live in such a place isn't good for your mental health. Disorder can be very depressing. They've made it, they've even made a reality, quote unquote, show out of this called hoarders. And it shows people who can't even walk through their living room for huge piles of newspapers and collectibles and stacks and stacks of clothes, many of them with the tags still on. And part of this is a consequence of compulsive buying in our culture. Fatigue is a real factor for such people. They just don't have the energy to put away the dishes, to sort through the papers on the desk, to organize the garage. It becomes a self-reinforcing syndrome where the enormity of the task keeps you from doing it. So the task gets bigger and bigger. At that point, they need professional help, not an exploitative cable television show. Now, my friends are divided between those who are neat and those who don't mind living with a certain amount of clutter. I fall towards the cluttered end of the spectrum, uh, not quite to the level of being a hoarder, but close enough that I'm not going to invite you into certain places in my house. <laughs> and I periodically I do get revved up and organize it and sort things. And I really like the environment after I do, but I don't put a high priority on that. My rebellious inner child would rather do anything else than clean his room. You know, I run out of time to do, to make things as neat as I'd like. But this cross-country move to Seattle forced me to silence that inner child and do what had to be done. And when, when I needed a break, sometimes I'd call friends to complain. And my, my neat friends would say, well, just get rid of all that crap. You don't need it anymore. And my friends whose basements and garages are jammed to the gills would tell me, hey, it's your stuff. Why not keep it? Anyway, millions of people around the world have gotten advice on decluttering and organizing from a young Japanese woman, Marie Kondo. Do I have a picture of her here? Not that I could show. Anyway, here's one of her books. In 2014, her book, The Life-Changing Magic of Tidying Up, hit the New York Times bestseller list, and Netflix followed up with a reality show demonstrating her techniques. <clears throat> and what I particularly particularly appreciate about the KonMari, or KonMari, I'm not sure how they pronounce it, method, as she calls it, is her appreciation for the feelings of the objects themselves and the feelings that people have about them. Part of her method is to acknowledge and thank the spirits of the things you're going to let go of. This is a very Shinto kind of spirituality, and no wonder she spent five years as an attendant maiden at a Shinto shrine. Here's what she writes about storing things where they belong. Although we may not be aware of it, our belongings work hard to support us every day. Just as we'd like to come home and relax after a long day's work, our things breathe a sigh of relief when they are returned to where they belong. It's very important to give our things the security of having a place to come home to. Things that are returned each day to their designated place are different. They have a special glow. 
If we take good care of our possessions, they will take good care of us. Now, for those of us, especially myself, especially included, who hold on to things not because of their usefulness, but because we're afraid that by losing them, we'll lose the memories that those objects embody, she writes this. We live in this moment. Who you are now is more important than memories of your past. Be good to yourself. It's so hard to let go of things that once brought us joy and are filled with precious memories. It feels like we're losing the memories along with them. But that is not the case. Memories that are truly precious will never be forgotten, even if we discard an item associated with it. What really matters isn't the past, but the person we've become thanks to those past experiences. We should use our space not for the person we once were, but for our future selves. I'd like to point out that when Marie Kondo wrote these books, she was a young person with no kids. And those of us who are in our 60s and 70s do sometimes need to sort through objects to remind us of days gone by. And I, as long as we don't let it get in the way of advancing our current life, I'd also like to point out that it's a lot easier for us Americans who have larger homes than the typical Japanese home do, do um, that we can hang on to things a little bit more than she would advise for her culture. And it's especially easy for us New Englanders who have a big old hay barn. Now, if you've ever studied religion, you may have heard of animism which is a characteristic of the Shinto faith. Animism perceives all things as animated and alive. When Kanmari goes through the steps of organizing with a client and it comes time to say, good, <coughs> say goodbye to something, she doesn't just toss it into a bag. She tells her clients to touch them and thank them for their service, for what they might have taught you, for the joy that they brought you, even if that joy was only at the moment you bought it. And this applies to the things you keep as well. She goes into great detail about the best way to fold your clothes and store them. And she writes, by touching your clothes with your hands, you pass on your energy. Try folding your clothes with gratitude in your heart for the way they protect you. And long before I read her book, I did things like this when it was time for an object to retire. It does make it easier. But have you done that? Thought about your clothes and thank them for protecting you? But Marie Kondo's most essential piece of advice is that when you set to clean things up, tidy up, as she says, you're not looking for things to throw away. You're looking for things that spark joy in you and make sure that you can put them in a place where you can take care of them and they're there for you. This was very helpful for me when I was purging my closet. I'd, I'm not a big clothes person. I buy a few shirts a year at best, but I called about 20% of the shirts in my closet that I hadn't worn in a long time because they didn't spark joy in me. I wouldn't wear them probably. Better to give them to the Salvation Army where others might find some joy in them. There are a couple of other pieces of good advice that I'll pass on, but if, if you need, it's good to get this book, I think, or one of her books. First is organize by category, not by room. For example, go all through all your clothes, the one in the front closet, the bedroom closet, in the basement. Go through all your books, whether they're in the library, the office, your bedroom, all your papers, all your kitchen stuff. You don't organize by room, like try to get the bedroom perfect because you're looking at the categories. The other suggestion is storage isn't the answer. And don't buy storage boxes, just use shoe boxes. Americans, of course, besides our big basements and garages, you see these public storage units where we stow things away and pay rent every month for a, a garage door that we never open. And there's another reality show called Storage Wars where when 
a storage place has been abandoned, bidders go to auction to see what's in there. Her other advice is leave sentimental items for last. Find out why you want to tidy up before you begin and visualize the life you'd like to have in the future. And before you organize, get rid of things that don't bring you joy or especially those that make you unhappy. Remember that things have not only material value, they have functional, informational, and emotional. She can be pretty ruthless, I must say, uh, especially when it comes to getting rid of books that you haven't read yet. So <clears throat> my conclusion for the sermon is you don't have to live like Gandhi. You don't have to let go of things that have emotional value for you, for you even if they're materially worthless. You'll never be perfect. Don't expect that. You'll never have the perfectly neat house except when you put it on the market. And Marie Kondo herself has three children and she's found that keeping a perfectly tidy house with three children is impossible. I found that with my own grandson. I'd take him up to read a book and instead of listening to the book, he's much more interesting in pulling each book out of his bookcase and laying them out on the floor. There's a part of human beings that is sort of like a wild animal spewing things all over the place. And another part of us that's sort of pejorative is anal retentive and hyper neat. But there is a point to respecting the things you have and taking the time to make your own personal environment the way you want it, whether that's tightly organized or a little bit cluttered, as long as it brings you joy and doesn't get in the way of the object of your life. Interesting word choice there, the objects of our lives, the physical things that surround us versus the object of our life, our goal or purpose. It may seem trivial to sermonize about being neat when we live in a world with war and racism and poverty and climate change, but keep in mind that your personal environment is entirely, one thing that's entirely under your control. Those other things are usually way beyond your control. But if you're totally out of control in your personal environment, how can you even hope to push the needle even a little bit on those big things? Well, here in our house in Kenmore, Washington, this is the after picture of the Marie Kondo visit. <laughs> Even the garden here is very Shinto-like. But don't think that the preacher is without sin. When I come back to you at the end of October to visit with you in person and take care of things at my house in Shelburne, I'll be the one with the big pile of junk on the floor. Until then, I hope you find the things that spark joy in you. All right. May it be so.